so I know I kind of went through this a little fast, so I'll just do a fresh review. That way you can catch up on verse 10. So as mentioned before, John said that he was in the Spirit in the Lord's day. And we found out that the Lord's day was referring to the tribulation timeline. And then what you're going to notice right here that because John is in the tribulation timeline, what is very important to understand is that everything that he writes then, it makes so much sense that it's going to have a tribulation application. And a lot of people wrongly take verses from Revelation and apply it to themselves. Where there are verses where it talks about losing your salvation, your name being blotted out of the book of life. Um, you have to do these works. But these verses are applying to people in the tribulation because John is writing as if he is in the tribulation. Now, the interesting thing about John when he talks about the tribulation timeline is that we do know, if you know a little bit about dispensationalism, is that this is the church age, and before the timeline of the church age is the rapture. And then what you're going to notice is that in Revelation chapter 1, which was very interesting, is that John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, right? He's in the tribulation. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So notice right here that the trumpet voice of God is mentioned. Did we miss all of this just now at the beginning? Oh, okay, just making sure. All right. So, the voice of the trumpet. Now, if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Revelation chapter 4, you're going to find out that the rapture is the trumpet voice of God. So, John said, behind me, right? So, there's a pre-tribulation rapture right there. So, this is very, very interesting. All right, now <clears throat> I'm going to continue on at verse 11. So that was just review. All right, so now let's look at verse 11. So remember, God is speaking here, saying, I am Alpha and Omega. Okay, so I didn't explain this last time, but Alpha and Omega, that's like literally the letter A and the letter Z in the Greek alphabet. So God's saying that I'm the beginning and I'm the last, the ending. Let's keep reading here. The first and the last. See, showing that he has no time. He, is, uh, he never had a beginning nor an ending. And what thou seest, write in a book. So God's telling John whatever he's seeing, he's got to write it in the book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. So John, whatever he's seeing in the book of Revelation, he's going to write it down and send it to seven churches I mentioned this in our last Revelation class. He's sending it to seven churches in Asia Minor. That's what's going on. And the name of the churches are mentioned here. Unto Ephesus and unto, <laughs> excuse me, unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. Okay, so let's cover these seven churches right here just a little bit, which is going to be interesting. And then I'm going to give you something on hermeneutics again. So that's going to be fun. I always love talking about hermeneutics. <coughs> so in the church age, we see seven churches mentioned here. In these seven churches, let's see these names right here. And when we go to chapter 2 and 3, it's going to be intensely interesting. <coughs> Ephesus, that means fully purposed. So let's look at these seven churches here. So the first one is Ephesus, and that means fully purposed. I don't have time to write it all out, so I'm just going to write the names of the churches. Smyrna, it means myrrh. Smyrna means myrrh. The next church is Pergamos, and Pergamos means much marriage. Much marriage. The next church is Thyatira. Thyatira means odor of affliction. Odor of affliction. 
The next church is Sardis. And Sardis means red ones. Sardis means red ones. The next one <coughs> is Philadelphia. Brotherly love. And the last one, which you heard this term quite often from my preaching and other people, Laodicea. And that means civil rights. Mm, right? Yeah, uh -huh. You can tell which day and age we're in, right? Yep. All right, anyways, <clears throat> I can't wait to rip up Laodicea once we go to Revelation 3, okay? Yeah. You live here long enough and you just appreciate this teaching more, a little bit more, okay? Okay, anyways, let's return to uh, verse 11. So he's speaking to seven churches and then he's going to, and he gave out the names of these churches. Now, what is important to understand as you read the book of Revelation, you're going to have to know three applications. If you know these three applications, then a lot of things are going to be eye-opening. So he's writing to these seven churches, and then if you keep these three applications in mind, it's going to be very helpful throughout the book of Revelation. <coughs> the first one is doctrinal. What is doctrinal? Doctrinal is a specific truth that the verse is telling you, specifically. So it is specific truth that is aimed toward a specific point right here. So reading it as it is, it, doctrine basically means teaching. That's what it means. Doctrine means teaching. So basically, if you see something in a verse, you're going to take it as it is and you're going to apply that truth. So in Revelation chapter 2, you're going to find out that it talks about uh, Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 about doing works uh, for salvation as well as blotting out the name out of the book of life. So that is a specific truth that we take and believe in. But what we do know is that it's going to be at a tribulation timeline. That's what you're going to see throughout the book of Revelation. When it talks about the doctrine, the truth of it, it's going to be applied to the tribulation timeline. The second thing is historical. Historical is understanding the history of that timeline. So an, an example is John is writing to the seven churches here. So because you got to know the history of that timeline, John is writing to these seven churches right here, uh, to these local churches, real areas. So this is real life situation on the history of that time. But you notice how it's differing from doctrine. See that? It's differing a little bit from doctrine here. Let me give you another example. So in the book of Psalms, we're going to look at the book of Psalms. Go to the book of Psalms. I think it's chapter 22. I'm going to show you how the applications are applied. We're going to look at Psalms 22. This is what people don't do. What they automatically do is that they combine the applications all together rather than dividing it. If you don't divide it, then you're going to come across problems. The third one is spiritual. Spiritual. In other words, you take a verse and then you spiritualize it. You can turn it into a valuable lesson. Uh, for example, when we take a passage about the Jews in the children of Israel who were uh, eating uh, quails, that's right. So they were eating quails at the wilderness. Spiritually, what that represented was that the quails represented flesh, the lust of the flesh. And then the Jews, spiritually, were representing the church right here. So you'll notice that a great easy example, an easy example is your pastor preaching on Sunday. Now you notice that your pastor sometimes will do history and doctrine, but what's the application he mostly uses in his preaching? Spiritual. Why? Because I'm hitting at a spiritual area you got a problem with, see? So I'm spiritually cutting you. And then as teaching, I go more on doctrine. So that's where the infamous Alexandrian scholars and secular scholars come out today, where they take verses. The uh, majority of cults 
What do they do with verses in your Bible? They spiritualize it. They always spiritualize it. William Lane Craig, brilliant guy debating atheists, just spiritualizes a passage about uh, the wolf lying down with the lamb and then the young lion with the calf. And then he talks about, he doesn't take it literally as it says. He says some kind of strange conundrum about what happened during Isaiah's timeline and that it just looked like in a picture that you're stretching the imagination there. So this uh, Jehovah Witnesses, they look at Revelation 7, and it mentions 12 tribes of Israel. They can't take it as it says. So they spiritualize it and say, well, that's referring to 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses. Who says that? You don't see that anywhere. So spiritualizing passages is actually pretty dangerous because then you, uh, you leave off the verse. But here's the problem. A lot of group, they're also called mid-acts or hyper-dispensationalists. They go by so much doctrine that they avoid spiritual truths. So, for example, revelation, we know, is applied to tribulation doctrine. But does that mean we're going to drop the book of Revelation and not get any spiritual lesson out of it? See? So that's dangerous. Mid-acts, hyper-dispensationalists, they are a dead group. You know why they're dead? Because it's not aiming for a spiritual area. It's all doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. I thought we're all for right doctrine. If you are for really for right doctrine, you're going to aim for something spiritual too, fella. That's what you got to keep in mind. <clears throat> now, Psalms 22, let's see how these three applications work. Now, that's going to be helpful in the book of Revelation. You're going to see me always go by these three applications as we interpret the book of Revelation. Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Okay, so what's this talking about? This is talking about King David here. Now, what application is going to be applied if we're talking about King David crying to God saying, you know, uh, I feel forsaken. What are you going to do? Help me out. It's historical right here. Because this is referring to David's timeline, what he's saying. But here's something. Doctrinally, what you're going to find out is that this is referring to Messiah, Jesus Christ. What did he say on the cross? Yeah. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Spiritually, we can see how this is a spiritual application to us. You feel like the one who's crying out in verse 1. My God, my God, why did you forsake me? See, so that's what you need to do. You need to have a threefold application, especially, here's something else. The book of Psalms is a prophetic book. Revelation already gave you a hint, it's a book of prophecy. Now, when you cover prophetic books, you know what you better do? You better have these three ready. That's good advice. Very good advice. If you don't have these three ready, you're going to come across a mess of doctrine. Isaiah chapter 53 is a great example. It is a great truth about Jesus Christ who's, become, who's the Messiah on our behalf and that he would die, bury, and resurrect it. Uh, but however, Isaiah 53, a lot of Old Testament Jewish scholars didn't see that. So what they like to do is that they would like to apply this to the nation of Israel going through their hardship. So then what they fail to do is reading the verse as it says. They spiritualize it, make the verses figurative. And that's very dangerous. God was trying to teach a doctrinal truth. And a doctrinal truth, he could be speaking at the present tense or the past tense, right. but it's actually referring to the future. Mm -hmm. Really, Pastor? Yeah, so here's an example. So what is important to understand is that when it comes to the Word of God, so prophecy or God's Word is not bound by time. That is very important to understand. It is not bound by time. Why? Because God can see things now at the past and see things in the future at the past, and et cetera, et cetera. He can see things at the present but be talking about the future, th see things about the future and refer them to the present. You know why? Because God is not bound by time. That's right. He is eternal. Human nature is all bound by time. So in Isaiah chapter 53, the verses, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. So I told you before, Isaiah 53 is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. 
but it's in the past tense. So what are we going to do? It's not a problem. It's still referring to the future prophecy of Jesus. Why? Because he's not bound by time. That's why when you look at Revelation 2 and 3, pay attention, even though he's historically writing to the churches there, and when he writes in the present tense, it is a doctrinal application to the tribulation. See how eye-opening this is going to be? Well, how do you know it doctrinally applies to the tribulation? We already covered it in our previous teaching. Uh, verse 10 already told you. Uh, John is in the spirit in the Lord's day. The first five verses of Revelation, we already, we already covered it. It's a book of prophecy. Prophecy. That's what God already gave a heads up on. So a lot of things that you see, even though he's speaking historically to seven local churches, he's th God is thinking in a doctrinal point toward the tribulation. That is very possible. You got to remember, you got to keep that in mind. Isaiah 53 Isaiah was speaking to the nation of Israel, but he's talking about Jesus. That's why it makes sense that when we talk about dispensationalism, about general epistles, from the book of Hebrews to the book of Jude, what you got to understand is this, is that even, even if you include Christians, that they were writing to ch Christian churches at that time, you got to think about this, it's the same thing like Revelation. They could, they'll, they'll be talking about tribulation stuff, tribulation doctrine in there. They're thinking that, oh no, because John says that he's writing to the church at the book of 2nd or 3rd John, that this is a Christian epistle. It cannot apply to the tribulation. So then they try to take the book of James and the book of 1st John, and they try to apply that to the Christian church. You can't do that. 1st John and the book of James and Hebrews, especially those books, they, up, they refer a lot to tribulation application there, even if you want to apply it to the church. So that's important to understand about biblical interpretation on hermeneutics. If you don't know this, you're going to come up with wrong doctrine. Oh, yeah. Because God already taught you that ever since the Old Testament about his coming uh, Messiah, Jesus Christ. If he used these three kind of application, he's going to do the same thing at the New Testament. Keep that in mind.